you know, the, the digital divide, the numbers are clear. Uh, sometimes people hear about internet access and they think video games or things that might be considered trivial. Tell us about whether there's a connection between internet connectivity and things that people really care deeply about, like economic mobility and healthcare outcomes. Yeah, there absolutely is, and, and there is some good research on this that uh, demonstrates um, today, for instance, um, the percentage of Fortune 500 companies that require folks to file a job application online, or the percentage of colleges that require folks to file their college application online instead of the old paper method. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the way that, that I see it and that we've seen this at HUD is that um, we're living in a 21st century global economy. And if we're truly going to prosper in the United States, we need to make sure that everyone has 21st century tools. And probably earlier, your audience uh, may have heard because uh, I know the White House has done a great job of distributing the statistic uh, that more than half of low-income households don't have uh, an internet connection right now. So we see it as key to economic mobility, uh, key to educational achievement. Um, I think they heard about the closing the homework gap. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things that help ensure that somebody can reach their American dream. How do you measure the success of programs like your Connect Home, which is going to be bringing uh, internet access at either for free or for a very low cost to, what, 275,000 or so families in public housing? That's right. Uh, about 275,000 families and up to 200,000 children. Mm. Uh, that is a fantastic question. How do we measure it? Because at one basic non-satisfactory level, you could measure it just by how many connections you get. I mean, it is making a difference, right, if somebody was not connected before and then they get connected. However, we really believe that it's more than that. It's, it's about digital literacy as well, ensuring that once somebody has an internet connection that they know what to do with it and how to make the best use of it, whether they're somebody who's in grade school or someone who's working age and may want to uh, try and get on a stronger path, uh, or a senior citizen. So. Uh, before we launched Connect Home, which is uh, the White House and HUD's effort to connect folks in 28 communities who live in public housing, connect them to the internet, uh, we talked about how are we actually gonna measure the success of this? And um, we are devising a model that will look at, do we have uh, higher educational achievement, uh, higher economic gains for folks who are able to participate? I have to say that um, you know, as many moving parts as Connect Home had, that was probably the most fascinating part of it um, because oftentimes in trying to measure outcomes that matter, you run into a lot of roadblocks of data sharing, mm. of folks arguing about, well, you know, privacy. what is the privacy? Yeah, well, and that's the data sharing part. Oftentimes institutions, whether they're uh, school districts or others, have privacy laws that hamper them sometimes from sharing that data. Uh, housing authorities as well have concerns. But um, if we can get that part right, we're convinced that something like Connect Home can be a calling card, further evidence of how much an interconnection, internet connection makes a difference in someone's life. Why do this in public housing? There are people who don't have good access to the internet in rural America, in, uh, in underprivileged suburbs and inner cities in the United States that um, aren't living in public housing. I mean, why, why, why do it in this particular community? Uh, well, there's, let me, I'll say there's a personal reason and then there's also, I think, uh, for HUD. Uh, I got uh, the call from President Obama asking if I'd be interested to take on this role uh, on, I think it was April 16th of 2014. I remember the date, because it's not every day that the president calls you and asks you if you want a job, unless some of y'all get asked all the time that. Um, and the number one thing I thought about, the first thing that I thought about was how we could use housing as a powerful platform for greater opportunity, particularly for young people who live in public and HUD-assisted housing. Uh, on top of that, though, 
there's a range of communities that, that, that are part of Connect Home. It's not just in the big cities. It is big cities. There's some medium-sized cities. There's a tribal community, the Choctaw Nation, that oh, also yeah. is part of this. And so I agree with you, you know, there's, there's value in diversifying that. But we concentrated on public housing um, because I think that that's, that's an organizing, physically an organizing and organizationally um, a, a way to, to easily increase the take up rate huh. of what we had seen out there, like great programs like Internet Essentials and others. You know, I want to commend uh, Comcast and others who, who, are, who have been working on this. Connect Ed, which the White House rolled out and also uh, has been making great progress. But I really see public housing as a powerful organizing force. Um, we have folks who are on the ground who are able to, to get to communities, where they, to get to families where they live and help sign them up. Everyone who lives in public housing um, is there because they are low income. The median income of public housing families is about uh, $12,500. So all of those going and trying to find the people who qualify, all of that, you, you cut through that, basically. So it used to be, I think, a few decades ago that, that in approaching public policy, that we thought about public housing more as that kind of platform or that platform and portal than we do today, we're trying to revive that way of thinking at HUD. Who pays for all of this and in the short term and who pays for it in the long term? Uh, well, uh, the, the, there's a common answer to that and that's that this Connect Home was really a partnership with nonprofits and internet service providers. So the internet service providers are the ones that are providing either free or very discounted internet access. There are certain nonprofits that are involved uh, that everyone on that is helping to coordinate that. Um, and then there are others like PBS, um, Boys and Girls Clubs that are adding on to that digital literacy efforts, Best Buy is another good example, um, and other aspects to, to en enhance education as part of the effort. Because I really feel like it's, it is not enough just to connect somebody to the internet. You have to layer that with greater educational efforts. Um, the one exception is that for the Choctaw Nation, I believe it was a $50,000 $50, investment from the federal government to, to help with some of the physical connection expenses. Ultimately, though, don't you hope that there will be some sort of a broader effect here in which the market responds uh, to the initiatives that the government is putting forward? Oh, absolutely, and I believe that they will. And, and one of the most interesting things is that with the Internet service providers, I think they see down the road that, that there is a market there uh, that can be cultivated. Uh, and I have not seen the data on this, but I'm willing to bet um, that just like with cell phones, once you start using a certain internet service provider, that people are generally loyal mm. to them. So, you know, I, I've had Sprint probably since 2001, 2002. I guess people change their, their cellular phone company a little bit more than they used to now, but still. So I believe that folks see a market I think a couple of guys from Verizon market. just walked out of the room <laughs> after. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. I mean, I use Verizon. I've had it since. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I do think that, um, you know, that, that there's that aspect to it. And we do hope that this shows that there's an intense interest in uh, public housing communities, but among low-income indi individuals and families for a connection to the Internet. Let me shift a little bit to the realm of politics. You this week said that Latinos needed to get more involved in the political process, needed to um, speak out more. What prompted that, and, uh, and, and specifically, what do you think that Latinos should be doing? Voting. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, in the 2012 election, uh, African Americans had a turnout rate of about 66%. Uh, whites had a turnout rate of between 64 and 65 percent, and, uh, and Hispanics had a turnout rate of 48 percent. And so the turnout rate is just not where it needs to be. And, um, you know, people can get offended at what Donald Trump says all they want. Are you? Sure, sure. Uh, do I think his comments were offensive? Sure. Um, but the only way to make your voice heard in our democracy is to actually go out and vote. 
And for folks who are not registered, they ought to register. Uh, and for folks who are registered but not voting, which is a tremendous number of people uh, in every community, you know, my comments were meant to say, you know, you need to go and participate. The Republican Party has two Latino candidates who are making credible runs for the nomination. The Democratic Party hasn't had as many candidates uh, jumping into that kind of a rung when they're assessed over the years in um, national presidential politics. Is the Democratic Party doing something wrong vis-a-vis -vis people with your background? I wouldn't say that the Democratic Party is doing anything wrong. Um, you know, my hope is that both parties will continue to reach out to the Latino community. Uh, there's no question that uh, a strong majority of Latinos are Democrats. And so I believe that whether it's in uh, California or New York or Texas or Illinois or other places, that in time you will see uh, strong uh, Latino candidates emerge. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, my hat's off to Senator Rubio and to um, Senator Cruz. Uh, I, I met Senator Rubio for the first time uh, when the Pope visited and spoke in Congress, and I told him, you know, that I had been down to Florida and that there are a lot of people who are very proud of him down there. Uh, I disagree with him politically on a lot of things, but... Uh, Did you tell him that too? Huh? Did no, we had like a 30-second conversation. I was getting to that. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that, that in time in the Democratic Party, you will see that. Looking at 2016, could you imagine a Latino, uh, say, in one of the top two spots, presidential or vice presidential, say vice presidential uh, on, on the Democratic side? Say maybe a former mayor <laughs> somewhere in the Southwest? <laughs> I, I doubt it. I'm not holding my breath is probably the best way to say it. I, uh, but I am trying to make sure that, that I do a great job at HUD because uh, you know, I've said that I've learned in life that the only way to make sure you have a great future, whatever that is, is not to forget about what's in front of you and do a great job with wh where you're at now. So um, I'm not counting on that uh, and I don't expect it, uh, but I am trying to do a good job at HUD. But it has to be pretty cool to be mentioned. To I mean, you must, you, I mean, yeah, yeah. not I mean, thinking I've said about before it. That, no, no, I've said before that, that who wouldn't be flattered by that, right? Mm. Uh, but I think the biggest mistake that, that could be made is, you know, you have a lot of people in politics that let an expectation get to their head, you know, that they're going to be the next governor, or they're going to be the next senator, or they're going to be president one day. And, and I think that that just causes you to lose focus on why you're there in the first place. And so, you know, I'm at HUD because I feel very blessed in my life to have had great opportunity. And whether it's this Connect Home initiative or other things that we're doing, we're trying to make sure that we extend that kind of opportunity to other people that need it. In order to attract Latinos to the polls and to vote for your party, what should the party be talking about? They should be talking about all of the issues that, that uh, matter to the American people because <clears throat> the issues that matter to the Latino community intersect very well with the issues that matter to the American people. You know, improving education, obviously improving, continuing to improve the economy, uh, making sure that, that we have, uh, as my brother has said, Joaquin, this infrastructure of opportunity so that people can reach their American dream. Um, obviously, immigration reform is, is a significant issue that, that is already being talked about in the 2016 cycle. But Democrats are talking about a lot of the issues and acting on a lot of the issues that matter to the Latino community. And they have the advantage of actually having a much better track record than the Republican Party on those issues, whether it's investing in health care, education, uh, the economy, or uh, on comprehensive immigration reform.
Yeah, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio have both uh, given speeches or made remarks in, in Spanish. Um, do you think that uh, a Latino politician needs to be speaking in Spanish with uh, voters? And tell us a little bit about your own relationship with the, na with the language of your ancestors. Yeah, so um, I understand Spanish pretty well, and I do speak some Spanish, but I'm not fluent in it. <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know, that there are a lot of folks, just like other immigrant groups, in, in the second and third generation, if you go to places like San Antonio or Denver or Phoenix or LA, or, um, that, that are kind of in my boat, you know, like speak some Spanish and understand it, but don't speak it fluently. And I, I believe that the, the American media and political class often sees this Latino community in a very one-dimensional way. Hmm. And I'll give you an example of that. A lot of media and entertainment companies, I think, believe that if you talk about content for the Latino market, that you're just talking about Spanish language content, mm -hmm. not realizing that there are tons and tons of, of Latinos, especially the younger generations, that are either English dominant or bilingual and actually end up watching English language television or English language internet sites and so forth much more frequently than Spanish. So it's a combination of those two things. Uh, I do think there is no doubt that it is a wonderful thing um, that folks are bilingual. Uh, and um, you know, I continue to improve my Spanish. But I think the most beautiful thing is that you know, when my mother was going through school, she was going through school at a time where uh, you know, they, would, they would slap your wrist with a ruler if you spoke Spanish. Mm. And now my daughter, who's six, year old, six years old, is going to a bilingual school. And the idea of speaking another language in our country is something that's heralded as a great thing yeah. and gives you an advantage, whether you go into business or politics or anything else. That's beautiful because it says something about the capacity for our country to improve itself, to get better. And uh, you know, even if my Spanish is not perfect, I recognize you know, I, that that my daughter is growing up in a world where that uh, bilingualism is valued, and that's a good thing. Well, you're invited to the post to chat in, in Espanol con nosotros. <laughs> si, si. Cuando quieres. Ojalá que si. <laughs> <laughs> Ojalá. <laughs> uh, let's take a couple of questions over here. I see you at me. We have one question from Twitter. Secretary Castro, I'm an intern for Senator Cory Booker. When I go back to the office today, what policy directives should I be pitching? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, knowing Corey, he's probably already pitching 100 by the time the intern gets there, because he's one of the most active senators. Uh, but I mean, I would just say uh, to, that, that his intern should thank him for the work that he is doing on criminal justice reform, uh, and to pass along the message that at HUD, that we believe that, that uh, housing policy has a role to play in enhancing the ability of folks to get a second chance in our country. And so I hope that, uh, that he or she will pass along that message. Right. One more question. This is from the audience. If we're working towards total inclusivity, is that going to imply that free internet is also on the way for everyone? Uh, well, I hope that that's the case one day. Uh, I don't believe that's going to happen right away, but um, you know, the White House, the President, um, has done a great job with Connect Ed and Connect Home of trying to ensure that more folks have broadband access. But we also see it fundamentally as a kind of public utility, um, you know, in the same way that you have electricity or you have water, that the Internet is this, this important to being able to function in the 21st century global economy. So I hope that over time that, uh, that it will mirror that. Uh, if, if I might just follow up on that, though, uh, we, we pay for the services we get from our public utilities. Um, how, how, how do you separate those, that kind of a system from a system that 
you seem to be advocating here, which would be for free internet service as a public yeah, it's, utility. It's a good question. Um, you know, when I was mayor, I sat on the board of the water utility and the, and the electric utility. And one of the things that I advocated for toward the end of my tenure with our water utility, for instance, was that we have a category in the beginning up to a certain amount of gallons every month that people would get for free um, so that people could subsist. And I don't know that there's a direct equivalent, maybe a certain number of hours or something, but you know, there are interesting ways to, to think about it. You know, it's just my opinion at this point, but, but there are ways to look at that, both in, with respect to water, electricity, and internet access.